who told you to rap or who, who put that idea in your head that you could be a rapper as well and not just one of the homies around him? Oh, I did. Oh, okay. You already had that plan yeah. while you were in jail or after you yeah, got I out? Yeah, I was writing. I've been writing rhymes since 1988. Oh, okay. Cool. You know, just when I would go to jail, I would spend my time, you know, studying, you know, scheming, writing up rhymes, you know, in politics and doing what I had to do to stay solid. But, you know, I knew... I. I I knew deep, deep in the recesses of my mind if I ever had a chance to showcase that I could put lyrics together, I would be able to, mm. but I never actually thought that it would take place, that right. I would get the opportunity to rap for anyone on a commercial level to where it would get exposed to the world. Right. You know, this was it was more like a hobby. Because mm -hmm. it must have just seemed like rappers were superheroes at the time because there were so few people that you had really yes. gotten famous as rapping because it wasn't like now where everybody we know has a crappy ass rap song on their <laughs> SoundCloud that nobody gives a fuck about. It. <laughs> That's the most normal thing in the world now. Yeah, 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 yeah it was, it yeah. was, you know, you, because you only had certain people that like I named about eight of them, but now it's, it's many more than that, yeah. you know, uh, many, many, many more. But, um, uh, yeah, it was, a uh, it was a great time to be in hip hop then because the, learning it and getting to collaborate with everybody who was popping, you know, from Exhibit to mm. Sugar Free, you know what I'm saying, to the newcomers like, you know, the Doggies Angels, you know, to, uh, the, you know, the Lost Angels, you know, that was my boy King Lou, rest in peace, and, mm -hmm. you know, Ruffiano, and it was like, it was... It was just everything that was hot at that time. It was like bring the heat to the table, mm. and we gon' and we gon' make it make it swing. <laughs> we are gonna let them see what we do. So was it an odd situation at that time because Snoop was dealing with his murder case on like during the the thing that that album that you've kind of made your debut on mm -hmm. that was like roughly based on Snoop's legal situation at that time. Was that something that was like an overwhelming concern at the time? Mm, well, I think when when me and him talked about it, when I asked him about it, I believe that he said, I'm going to beat this shit, D. Okay, so he was confident. Yeah, he said, he said I'm going to beat this shit, D. You know, and, you know, he, he, he embraced me as not like an artist initially. It was like, you, you the big homie, you part, and you're going to be part of the squad. Right. So, you know, it's never been a relationship like, you know, uh, I'm I'm trying to come get studio time mm. from him or, you know, locate where they were or whatever. It's like, we here, we doing this, this going on, let's get this done. Let's, you know, I'm <clears> pulling <throat> up over here. You want to go out here with me? We finna tour. You know, I done been all around the world, mm. you know, um, on, on some of his tours with him and... You know, it, it just took me from one world to a whole nother world. Right. And, you know, I, um, I lasted, you know, in 11 years, you know, just grinding and putting it in before I caught my case that took me away for 10 and a half years. And I've been home for like over five years now. Yeah, so that's, yes. that's how you like break up your life, basically, is that you had this like 10, 11 year stretch of putting in work as a traveling rapper slash supporting other rappers, all that shit, and then that was like the end of that era is when you caught that additional case. It was over. Mm. Yeah, that was done. Right. Yeah, that was done. We still had a couple of projects that we had in mind to, to push, and, you know, thankfully I had loved ones that kept, kept me alive in the memory of hip-hop, you know, my wife Cognac, one of them, you know, she she pushed the free big trade these shirts her and you know she have her cousins with her and they be pushing. Shout out to Crooked Eye. She held you down the whole time. Oh yeah, wow. Yeah, the whole get down. How long have you been together before you went in? Well, I believe our child was probably like about she was about like six or seven. Wow. 
at that time. That's got to be a, a small percentage of guys who go into prison and then leave and still have the same girlfriend that they went in with. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you, you can't blame them either. Well, when we, yeah, when we decided that, you know, it was going, we was going <clears> to <throat> be together and get through the time together mm -hmm. and, you know, we was going to march together after all this was said and done, then, you know, it was, it was just, you know, just, just get to the task. Right. Let's get to the task of getting past the time. Was it like, it must have been so different for you going in to do that 10 years, given that you had seen a lot, done a lot, been around the world, had all these experiences versus average person who's in prison ain't seen or done shit besides what's around them when they're, <laughs> when they're born. right. You ain't bullshit. I got a friend of mine yeah. who's like a pro BMX rider, and he was telling me about being in prison. He's like... He's like, bro, you don't understand. He's like, all I got to do is talk about being in Paris. He's yeah. like, ain't none of these dudes been to Paris. I've been to Paris a couple of times. They're looking at me like I'm a fucking genius or some shit. <laughs> That's the truest shit in the world. <laughs> you know, people that, you know, you had to separate yourself from a lot of people because all they want to do is hear the stories and be around you so they can write their people. Yeah, I'm hanging around Trey D every mm. day. That's my boy, you know, this, that, and the other. So you, run, you encounter a lot of that, but... Nah, just, yeah, it was devastating, you know, on the real, Adam, on the real. So I'm like, uh, I'm like, once this is over with, I got to figure out how to never put myself in this position mm -hmm. again. And, you know, that started, that started with realizing that I was in a position in my life at one time to have whatever I really desired, and I didn't treasure it and value it as much as I should have. Mm -hmm. Is that part of what goes through your mind when you're watching that clip from 2003 is that those are good times, but at the same time, the way you were living at that time was just not a, a long-term plan? It was. It right. was. I mean, I was, yeah, I was full throttle. It was like I couldn't separate. I could, I didn't want to. I could, but I didn't want to separate the success from the streets. Right. It's like. I'm going to stay real to both of them. Mm. And you either got to choose one or the other. You right. can't serve two masters. And that's what the problem when you become like a famous gangster is that. It is. It's, it's like, a big problem because yeah. you deal with the streets still. Mm -hmm. You still going to deal with the streets, you know, because. I, I was just reading this article about Nicky Barnes mm -hmm. and how he was on the cover of, I think, the New York Times. And that the, the, and the whole thing was like, can the police catch him or whatever and that's what made the president get so interested in his situation that ultimately got him caught up mm -hmm. like the fact that he was willing he was so cocky that he was willing to go on the cover of a fucking newspaper to say like y'all can't make a case against me that's crazy i mean the same thing when they put john Gotti on the cover of time right who wants to really be that big of a gangster everybody really does when they start off truthfully mm -hmm. You know, that's your aspiration when you when you pushing that gangster lifestyle. It's like I want my when my name is said, I want people to fear it, I want people to respect it, you know, and I want I want doors to open and motherfuckers damn near to bow down and curtsy when I step in the <laughs> joint. That's you like know? the initial uh, dream before you realize that that's kind of not the dream, that the dream is to have money and to be able to take care of yourself and not have to worry about shit. But <laughs> yeah. that just being feared is to a lot of people, that's their like, initial goal in a way. But, you know, to, to me, my program has never been pushed to where I've been trying to strike fear in people. It's just that you know that if we go to that position – in the game where we opposing each other, you already know what I'm going to come with. So and if you want to come with that, then let's go there. Mm. You know, let's not you know, let's not play games with it. You know, I'm not going to talk about you behind your back. I'm not going to try to, you know, take over your spot. I'm not going to try to steal your girl. I'm not one of them kind of people. I've never been one of them kind of people. I ain't going to snake you. If my relationship with you is solid and is real, it's going to be real, and especially if you're my homeboy. Mm. You know what I mean? So I'm going to give you that level of love and loyalty. Apart from that, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's like I don't want nobody to fear me. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to fear because I want you to understand that you don't have nothing to fear from me except you trying to fuck over me. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe when you become smart and wise enough 
to to be able to make that balance to where you don't have to do crazy shit to to, to have motherfuckers like oh shit I can't do that to him he might do this and that they just know you know like I believe at that time people knew Trady keep a gun on him at all times so if whatever you going to do whatever however it's going to go just know that just know that and he don't he don't be flashing it he don't do all that it was actually slipping in my slacks at the time you know i had the suit on so i had to adjust it and he caught me in the moment mm. and that just happened to go viral i guess from that time. oh really okay yeah, that's yeah, what that wasn't was like hey let me show y'all my gun right you know not a, I, that's goofy shit. so much shit is based on reputation just in the sense that you know we we all know dudes who that's what people say about them when people bring him up it's like that dude got it on him all the time and especially like I know a dude who's who's doing like at least eight years right now. He's in New York City, and mm-hmm. that's what people would always say to him is like this fool. Every single time you ever seen him, he had it on him, and it's just that that right there that amplified his reputation like in my head. And I'm a grown ass man that is not a gangster and has no reason to really be thinking about shit in this context. But that made me think like, bro, that dude is wild as hell. Like he's yeah. nobody should fuck with him because he's he's ready for it. Yeah, yeah. Why? Yeah. If you're not gonna play, if you're not gonna play right by his rules, you know, not that you have to conform to my rules, but you know what my rules are to fuck with me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's a certain level of loyalty, certain level of loyalty that's going to be expected. Mm. You know, it's going to be a certain level of trust that I'm going to have to be able to confide in you. You Something might go down, I might have to snatch you and we might have to go handle some business and leave that where it is. So... If I can't if I can't really confide and count on you in that for that, then you probably don't even want to entertain me. Mm. You you probably, you know, no, nah, I ain't gonna fuck with D on that level because you know what? I feel like this right now, but I probably ain't gonna feel like this in a few days, but I know him, he ain't gonna let it go. Mm. You know what I mean? So that's all it is, man. Just staying raw and real. Definitely. Are you able to talk about the situation of why you did the 10 years? Can you tell that that story a little bit? Uh, Yeah, it was just a situation where some guys pulled up on me and, you know, they was playing and I wasn't. Oh, okay. You know, and, uh, you know, they stopping by my car and, you know, flexing and, you know, exposing and I just wasn't having none of it. So, okay. you know, I sent them on their way and they way happened to be straight to the gang enforcement and say, oh, Trey D, he did this and that. And, you know, and they came over there and some people at the barbershop around there confirmed the story. Oh, we saw him coming out over there and yeah, we heard it. And then he pulled off. So everything was corroborated by the time I made it home that night, you know, I was coming out the shower and it, they was coming up with beams and all that and wow. you know had my family downstairs and you know they look for the gun they they found a few is a few that weapons. is that the kind of situation that you'd been through like many times in your life but you never thought that that was the kind of situation you would get caught up with because you're just not used to dudes popping shit and then going straight to the cops yeah, I mean, no, the situation definitely that's that's happened a few times, you know, where you had to be like, man, boy, quit playing with me, right? You know, but yeah, to I never imagined that they would tell, they would go tell like that because they initiated exactly yeah. the whole get down. So I said, wow, they playing a whole different game out here now. So, you know, I I took steps to safeguard myself since then. But you had no chance of getting off on self defense or anything. They weren't trying to hear it. Um, insane crip since 1977. You've been to prison seven times, eight times. Yeah, uh, you've been arrested for gun charges six of those times. Dope. Yeah, you rap about this, that, and the <laughs> other. Sure, self defense. We got you. Right. Yeah, give him a couple of years in the cushy little place and let him go. Oh man. They weren't having that. They started off with 19 years. And 16, they really wasn't budging. And my lawyer, uh, Frank DiGiacomo, hope he's all right. He had um, had a slip and fall in his bathroom. So a, a lawyer, uh, Walter Urban, a lot of people say different things about Walter. You always been straight with me, Walter. I hope you're still living good. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had to take over the case. And he talked to the supervisors and 
He said, look, man, I got them to knock four off. They down to 12. They not going to single digits. You going go to go to trial tomorrow or, you know, whatever. I was like, look, man, let's go. So, so you went into it. What was your mentality going into it? Because I feel like you already felt like you were too late in, in your career to be doing that at that point. Like you thought that a lot of that shit maybe had was in the past in terms of the likelihood of you actually catching a case? Like did or were you still like a hundred percent in the shit to the point where you weren't that surprised? I was still in the shit. Yeah, I was still <laughs> okay. in the shit. I was still in the shit. I just didn't think I would get caught like that. Mm. You know. And you know, it was a learning lesson, you know. I I was able to go in there and, you know, recalibrate uh recalibrate and calculate my life to follow a better path right. all the way around. You feel I, like you became a much better person in there? I did. Mm. I did. I accepted Islam in there. You know, I took my Shahada. Um, like I said, I've been on the streets for over five years now. You know, I still pray five times a day. I fast every Ramadan. You know, I, I pay my zakat. Uh, you know, I got to take my hajj soon enough. And, uh, you know, I'm... Sticking with the script, you know, me and God got a good relationship now that I needed to go in there and mm. really form. And, you know, it's helped me in my life ever since I exited. Definitely. Yeah. You feel like you just, yeah, you just grow up a lot in there in terms of just having all that time. to so just think about the stuff that you were doing before that. And then you just kind of came out as a different person trying to live at a different speed. Definitely. That's definitely how it happened. Mm. You know, I saw that, you know, I would get letters from France and Scotland and, uh, you know, Sweden and other places I've been and you, and they would be like wishing me well and telling me how much I meant to hip hop and stuff like that. And, mm. you know, I wasn't getting a letter from, you know, too many of my homeboys or, you know, from, from my city, you know, I was like, damn. I rep, I rep the turf pretty hard all my life, mm. you know. <laughs> Is that a weird realization when you go in to do 10 years? You realize that you feel like the people <coughs> back home don't give a fuck the same way that you thought that they would? Yeah, mm. yeah. And you know what? <coughs> Me being out here, to be honest, you know, you, you, you really get to understand out of sight, out of mind. Because the world moves so fast right now, and it, it has always <coughs> moved at a pace where if you're not really in – in the thick of it, you won't be able to grasp the momentum that's required to 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 not only sustain what you have, but to increase. So, I mean, from a legitimate platform, if you're not selling dope, if you're not robbing people, I mean, if you're living legitimately. So, you have to understand that it's the transition that you make from there to the streets, you you have to get in the system. Mm. And if you don't understand what the system is, then you're going to fall victim. The system is you being able to provide for your family, you pay your bills, you know, like you were saying a little bit earlier, you know, just living comfortably, comfortably and responsibly. Mm. You know, it's, if you want the flashy shit, you got to take the risks that come with the flashy shit. Right. You know, if you're not, you know, it's it's steps to get to where you want to get to. And if, you know, you have to know how to to progress from step to step. So I, I came to realize that from the time that the time that I was able to sit in there and reflect. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, regardless whether the city loves me as much as I would expect them to, I understand that. You know, people only believe what they see. If they don't see you, then they're not really knowing about the condition that you're in mentally, financially, you know, spiritually, whatever. But when they see you out here, then the assumptions begin. You know, it's like if they if they can't pull up right to where you live and be like, hey, look, Trady right there, there go his car, there go that and they don't see you for a while, but they see you in other platforms and doing other things, they automatically assume that you're doing much better than you might even be doing. Right. And and they and people take liberties with their assumptions. Uh -huh. So especially on like a street level, people are very quick to like make an assumption if they don't see you around or whatever that that you fell off or you, you ain't fucking with people anymore. 
you know, either or, yeah. either or, either you fell off and you hide, or you know, you done got to a level where you don't require them as friends or associates no more. Mm.